I don't believe in Jesus. Hey, first you do things sometimes the things you don't make up then you're happy. So that's one reason not to be jealous. We're coming up here and like, oh no, staff is so cool. And then we're gonna go to the All right, you should be able to find lesson 47 in Shobi. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 20. Bibles coming to close on the first book of Kings. So lesson forty seven Ahab Naboth, a story you're probably pretty familiar with, which is good. Take a look at it maybe a little bit more in depth than you have in the past too. So 1 Kings chapter 20, uh, towards the end is where we pick up because we read through there. So I'm going to start reading at verse 35. And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor, And the word of the Lord smite me, I pray thee. And the man refused to smite him. Then said he unto him, Because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. Then he found another man, and he said, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man smote him, so that in smiting him, so that in smiting he wounded him. So the prophet departed waited for the king by the way, and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king, and he said, Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle. Behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me, and said, Keep this man, if by any means he be missing. Then shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. And as the servant was busy here and there, he was gone, and the king of Israel said unto him, so shall thy judgment be. Thyself hast decided it. He hasted and took the ashes away from his face, and the king of Israel was dis and the king of Israel discerned him that he was of the prophets. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. And the king of Israel went to his house heavy and displeased, came to Samaria. This first part is a simple lesson for the prophets back then, but still a lesson for us too. And that is we have no choice in whether we want to obey God or not. Here is a man of God, a prophet coming to another prophet in the school of prophets. And they're teaching them that when God tells you to do something, you do it, whether you like it or not. not. Jonah failed in that regard when he was commanded to go to Nineveh, and he disobeyed the Lord, and we see all of the consequences that came to him after that. So the same is here. These prophets in the school need to learn. And so <coughs> maybe a head or teacher prophet comes up and knows says, the Lord says, smite me, smite me across my face. The cop says, no, 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 I can't do that, I want to hit you. Then when you walk out of here, when I leave you, a lion's going to come and it's going to destroy you. And sure enough, it happened. What was the lesson that all the rest of those prophets learned? <coughs> they must obey the Lord unequivocally, without any question. They must do what the Lord says to do. So when he goes up to another prophet, he says, smite me. 
that prophet slaps him across the face as he should, as he was commanded to do. This is an important message, an important lesson that they have to learn. Now this prophet then goes out by the roadside, and he sits there and he puts on, it looks like, uh, some ashes, and he covered himself so that he was a bit disguised. And as the king cried out, or as the king came by, he cried out. And he told the king, I went out in the midst of battle, and a man turned aside and brought a man to me and said, Keep this man. So he gave me a responsibility of being a guard for this man. If I'm missing, or if that man's missing, I have two choices then. I either will die myself, or I have to pay a talent of silver. Well, no prophet would have enough wealth to pay a, a, a talent of silver. Any man would know that back in those days. That would be impossible. So it must be then, the king says to him, Well then, if you've got no money, then there, we know what's going to happen to you. You are going to die. That is the judgment that you deserve because, well, you, you didn't do your job. And then that prophet rises up, clears off the ashes or the skies that he has, and the king immediately recognizes him. This man is a prophet. And King Ahab then has to hear this word from the prophet. The prophet says, Now King Ahab, you were told by God that when you capture the king of another nation, you destroy him. You put him to death. You kill him. You wipe him out. You didn't do that. You became friends with King ben Hadad. So because you didn't do that, then God will require your life of your house. Okay? The Lord will require it. Well, Ahab, here he probably was coming back pretty happy and triumphant. Now all of a sudden his mood changes and he's sullen, he's sour, he's unhappy. He goes back to his palace and he's probably not very cheerful to be around for a while. But he's got a heart that's hard. He really doesn't care about the Lord and probably soon he gets caught up in his own pleasures and begins to have a joyful heart once again. And that's what leads us to chapter 21. Let's see what happens there. Verse, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Hard there means it's right up against it. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near to my house. And I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or, if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto me. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word, which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. Your parents, maybe you hear them speaking from time to time especially when the spring comes. Maybe they look out the window and see the garden. They begin planning, what should we buy this year? Maybe some tomatoes. How many rows of beans? Should we get some onions or some pepper plants? What is it that we'll be planting? They plan. Or maybe they look out the window and they're, they've been scheming. You can tell Dad's been daydreaming. And he says, well, the family's getting larger, running out of a little bit of space. We might need to expand the kitchen. What do you think, dear? And he talks about then out the window, maybe we can move this wall this way a few feet and this wall a few feet this way. <coughs> well, we can gather that uh, King Ahab walking in his palace, looking down. He sees a beautiful vineyard and he thinks, now there, that would be a nice piece of property to have for me. It's right up against my land. King Ahab, being a wealthy man, thinks... I know what I can do if I want that. I'll go offer the man more money than what it's worth. If it's worth 100 shekels, maybe I'll give him 110 shekels. And if he doesn't want money, well, I've got some fine, fine farmland, but it's further away from my palace. So it would be more suitable for him to have because I want the stuff close by. I'll offer him that land, better land for him to use. And so he goes out and he finds the man who owns that land, Naboth, probably out there working in his garden, tending to the plants and the vines and the grapes and everything else. And he says to him that he wants the land. And Naboth says to him, O king, I humbly 
have to refuse. You see, the Lord gave the commandment to all of us when we received our piece of property, our parcel of land, that we were not to sell it or to trade it because this land is a picture of the promise that we have in the land of Canaan, that future place where we go when we die. And if we are to sell or to give away this land for some earthly benefit, <coughs> we are showing by that that we really don't care about our heavenly home. So I can't do it, Master. King Ahab, acting childlike, pouting, goes and has a temper tantrum, probably huffing and puffing, all kinds of other, rolling his eyes, throwing his arms up, kicking the doors, and whatever other things you guys know you're tempted to do when you don't get your way. That's Ahab. He's found lying on his bed, refusing to eat. Well, then what happens? Well, in comes his wife. <coughs> Verse 5, But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so bad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, I will, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou not? Now govern the kingdom of Israel. Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal, and sent the, letter, sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And set two men, sons of Belial, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. And the men of his city, even the elders and the nobles who were the inhabitants in his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them, and as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them, they proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. There came in two men, children of Belial, Belial would be Satan or the devil, and sat before him, and the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones, that he also died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. So Jezebel comes into her husband and sees him sullen laying there, and she probably rolls her eyeballs and says, here we go again, being in his childish way. What do you need, King? What do you need, my husband? And he says, well, I wanted the land of Naboth, and he wouldn't give it to me, and he's probably all pouting and sad. She says, are you not the king, man? Don't you give orders around here? See, and that way Ahab was very meek and meager when it came to his wife Jezebel. She kind of ruled the roost. It was not a godly marriage with the husband being the rightful guy here, and the ruler. And so what happens? Well, she uses sin. She wrote letters in Ahab's name. She would have signed them with his name. She would have used his seal to seal the wax seal on it so that the letters appeared to come from King Ahab, and they ordered men in the land to send. Let us find two wicked men who are willing to lie for anything. We'll give them a price, and they'll come in, and they'll say that they heard Naboth swear, use God's name in vain. The punishment for that is death. You see? Can Jezebel get to heaven and say that she didn't know about God or understand? No. She has no excuse, because she knows she knows the punishment for using God's name in vain. That means she knows God's law. She knows what's right and wrong. And so she uses that against Naboth. Men come in. They confess. Yep, he did it. He's taken out of the city. He's stoned to death. And now she can go to her husband and tell him the news. You get the land. <coughs> Verse 16. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite and to take possession of it. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whether he has gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where the dogs licked the blood of Naboth, 
shall the, do- shall the dog lick thy blood, even thine. Now, King Ahab isn't stupid. He knows exactly what his wife is going to do. She's going to go out, she's going to come up with some big plan to get him this land. He probably doesn't even want to know by now. He said, I don't even want to know what that evil woman is thinking or does. I'm just going to ignore it and pretend I didn't do your thing. And then she brings him the good news. Wow, Naboth's slain is yours. He's probably, I don't want to even know. Don't, don't say it. But he knows in his heart what his wife has done. What foolishness. So God sends the prophet Elijah to come to Ahab and he says, What have you done? Have you murdered and taken possession? King Ahab, not being real happy, not even giving an answer. Oh, mine enemy? He views Elijah as someone who, whenever he comes before him, constantly is rebuking him. Do you ever come with anything good to say, Elijah? There's a better way that we could put Ahab's words here. But he too, he also in this way admits that he knows that Ahab or Elijah is a man of God and who God is. He too will have no excuse, just as no man in the end will have any excuse to say, well, I didn't know. There's no way I knew, Lord. That's not true. Well, Elijah has to tell him, because of what you've done, your punishments will be very strong. Because you have killed the Naboth, in the same pla- in the same place where the wild dogs licked Naboth's blood, the dogs will also lick your blood too. Right. Well, that's not the end of it. Also, if we go on to verse 23, look what will happen to Jezebel. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dogs shall eat. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air be. What a humiliating. Here's these two people who think very highly of themselves and how important they are. And they have a very humiliating end. The animals are going to come and tear their flesh. They aren't even going to be able to bury their bodies into the ground. And it won't just happen to Ahab and Jezebel, but it will happen to his family too. The family of Ahab has been judged and has been found guilty. They have fallen short. Well, what does King Ahab do? Well, he makes it appear as though he was very sorry. He makes it appear as though he's turning from his ways. Verse 27. When it came to pass, when Ahab heard those words, when he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted, and lay in sackcloth and went softly. Looks like a man to me who's maybe repented. It's just as we heard in the sermon yesterday. You can't just say you're sorry. You need to confess your sins, say you're sorry. Then, you have to ask for forgiveness. And then you have to turn out of your wicked ways. Well, Ahab knows how to do everything outwardly. Outwardly, he was sorry. Outwardly, he wanted to impress those around him. But inwardly, he didn't say, God, I am sorry. What I did was wrong. No, probably on the inside, he's, who is this man to tell me anything? I'm sick and tired of hearing him, but I better do what I told to do outwardly or else I'm in trouble. But in his heart, he didn't really care. That's important for you and me, hopefully in our hearts too. When we're sometimes chastised by our parents or directed. We don't get stubborn in our hearts either and Mom and Dad think they know. I know so much better. Well, we pray that we don't have a heart that way. So why doesn't God send lightning or some way to kill Ahab immediately? Well, sometimes we talk of a cup of iniquity. The cup of Ahab's iniquity was not quite full. There's still a few more drips that we can fit into this cup before it is full and begins to overflow. When it's full, then God will send judgment. But it's not quite full yet. 
So time time will come. Ahab will have his end. And his blood will be licked up by the dogs out in that field, just as Naboth's was. So we can be thankful for that too. That God has paid for our sins. And although we might show sorrow for our sins just as Ahab did, it doesn't stop there. We confess our sins to God and then we turn from them. We leave them. We say, I won't do it again, Lord. And we try and we try not to. We begin to strengthen ourselves by reading God's word. Growing in grace. Excuse me, in understanding. So God works that spirit in us. He gives us hearts that are able to, whereas Ahab did not have a heart that was able to truly. He knew what to do outwardly, but in his heart of hearts, and that's what we need to be careful that in our heart of hearts too, we don't grumble and complain and become angry as Ahab did. 